probably put in there by some illiterate bureaucrat at the, <laughs> the past the time. Welcome to the Spoken Tome Audiobooks podcast series. In this episode, Mark Jeftovic talks with Dr. Christian Nemitz, author of Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies. You need to hear this. Hi everyone, Mark Jeftovic here from Spoken Tome Media, and today I am excited to be talking to Dr. Christian Nemitz, the author of Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies. Dr. Nemitz is the head of political economy at the Institute of Economic Affairs. The IEA is the UK's original free market think tank founded in 1955. Their mission is to improve understanding of the fundamental institutions of a free market society by expanding the role of markets in solving economic and social problems. Dr. Nemitz has a master's in economics from the University of Berlin, PhD in political economy from King's College in London, and he interned at the Bolivian Central Bank. So if anyone knows uh, what they're talking about when it comes to um, free markets and price signal discovery, I would guess it would be Dr. Nemitz. So thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thanks for the invitation. You know, we, we, we went back and forth with a few points over Skype this week on what we would talk about. But then yesterday after we last exchanged, I came across um, a article on the Hill. And I thought it would be a good place to start because the que- it poses the question, When we're talking about socialism as a failed idea that never works and will never die, what are we talking about really? Because The Hill cited a study that polled numerous people and 6% of the respondents thought that socialism meant being social and being on social media. So given this resurgence today in the love affair with democratic socialism and so forth, what are we even really talking about when we say that this is a, a failed idea that never dies? Well, I would like to believe that it is just a semantic confusion and that it just means different things to different people, but most of them do not think of actual socialism in the way that the dictionary defines it. But I'm afraid that's not true. Uh, yeah, 6% saying it means being social on social media, that, that sounds like a lot, but... What happens here is that in any survey, any option that is available will be picked by at least some people. There is uh, a term for this that's called the lizard man's constant because there was a survey in, I think, the, the US once where people were asked, do you believe that the world is, ru- is ruled by intelligent lizard men from outer space? And uh, something like 4% said yes. And so that just shows that in no survey can you ever conceivably go below 4%, no matter how absurd any option that is available will be chosen by at least some people. And uh, 4%, 5%, that seems to be the, the absolute lower bound. So, And, and once you've, uh, you've come across this number, you see it everywhere in polls. For example, I've recently seen a poll here where people were asked... Um, what they made of the Brexit negotiations. And there were among uh, UKIP voters, which is the most uh, fiercely pro-Brexit party uh, for, for a long time, was about nothing else. There were about four or five percent of self-identified UKIP voters who said they actually wanted to stay in the EU, which makes no sense whatsoever, because then why would you vote for a single issue party that uh, is about nothing else but leaving the EU? But this, this just confirms uh, this, this lizard man constant is uh, is everywhere. And once you subtract that from your six percent, there's nothing left. Uh, I'm afraid we are uh, talking about actual socialists rather than people who just misunderstand the term. And so how would we quickly, in a nutshell, define what actual socialists stand for? Because as, as you've noted throughout the book, uh, after it's been proven not to work, they usually turn around and say, that's not real socialism. Yeah, well, the, the dictionaries are quite clear on this. They usually say, uh, with some minimal variation from dictionary to dictionary, but they they usually say it means collective or government ownership of the means of production and distribution of economic output. So basically a state-run economy where you have um, the, the government 
owning most businesses, deciding what is produced and who gets it, how it how it is distributed and allocated. It's an economy run collectively. That's essentially what it means. Right. And people often, people outside of the Nordic countries often hold up the Nordic countries as an example of successful socialism. But as you explore in therein, it, uh, they are not socialist countries by the definitions that we're talking. No, that definition is uh, perfectly clear. There, there could, in theory, be borderline cases, but I'm not aware of any real-world example that that would be on uh, on the borderline. It, it is perfectly clear if you apply that definition that the former Soviet Union was socialist, that all of its Eastern European allies were socialist, that North Korea is socialist, that Cuba is socialist, that, uh, that Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge was socialist and so on. And it's also equally clear that the Nordic countries are not socialist, simply because the great majority of companies there are privately owned. And they have a system of free market prices, very few prices would be set by the government other than for things like um, for for some utilities where, uh, where where prices are regulated pretty much everywhere in the world. So the Nordic countries are, the Nordic governments are not more interventionist than uh, any other government of of market-based economies. They are actually in, in some ways freer economies. So there are indices that try to measure that the degree of economic freedom and the degree of, uh, of business friendliness there is the World Bank's ease of doing business indicator. There's the economic freedom of the world indicator, uh, which tries to measure the degree to which an economy is market-based on a scale from zero to 10, where zero would mean full communism. Uh, 10 would mean completely uh, unhampered capitalism. Of course, nobody, no country in, in the world uh, gets either a score of zero or 10, but you get some that, that get 8.9, 8.8, 8 8.7. And uh, the Nordics are usually fairly high up. So they're not the freest economies in, in the world, but they are definitely in in the top um, 20. Most of them, of course, there's, there's variation between them. Uh, and uh, they are the only thing that counts against them is that they do have high taxes and a large public sector but economic freedom means many other things as well you can have a relatively uh, lightly regulated relatively free market um, but high taxes at the same time which would mean that the government leaves you alone to do your business largely it uh, effectively protects your property rights and, uh, and and leaves you to go about your business in peace it just takes a large slice of uh, of the income that you generate in that way of incomes and, and profits and it uses that to fund of a large and generous welfare state so that's what the nordic countries do but even then even on those terms they are not particularly unusual by European standards. So the the size of the state in those places would not be higher than in their neighbor countries. So if you, on that basis, start labeling countries socialist, then you would have to do that to virtually the whole of, of uh, definitely Western Europe and, and possibly several examples beyond, because the size of the public sector, the size of, of the state in, in general is also very, uh, the state is also very large in, in France, in Belgium, in Italy. So once once you start using the term socialism in that way, then pretty much all of Western Europe would be socialist, with the exception of, exception of Switzerland and Ireland. Those are the, the low tax countries. But otherwise, there's not, absolutely nothing unusual about the Nordic countries. I think they're just being singled out because they work. Mm -hmm. These are places that, that are very prosperous and uh, they they also have, um, I mean, okay, they're, they're having problems now, but at least historically they've, they've long had very low crime rates and they, they were very socially cohesive societies. And, and at the same time, having dynamic market economies, a lot of innovation happening there. So, yeah, I guess... Uh, there, there, there would be a temptation if, if you're a socialist and, and you look for, uh, for, for real world examples, then there, there might be a temptation to look at those places and to exaggerate the socialist aspects of them. 
but they are really not socialist in any conventional sense. For example, I've recently looked up the uh, the Swedish government has a report on government owned enterprises. And um, I've, I've had a look at that report. Does the Swedish state operate something like around 40 companies where it is either the majority uh, and either the sole owner or uh, it owns at least a, a, sh a certain share, majority or minority share. Uh, but 40 is really not a lot, uh, especially if you bear in mind that this includes infrastructure providers, uh, organizations that would be state owned pretty much everywhere in the world, even in, in places like Hong Kong and Singapore, I guess, if you have some, some, um, so, some, some traffic agency and you label that a company rather than just part of the, the public sector in general, then yeah, you, you can easily arrive at a figure of, of 40, but that's not a lot. I don't know what the equivalent figure would be for the Canadian government, but I would not be surprised if it were more than that. So the, the Swedish state is not an, a, a big entrepreneur that uh, gets involved in economic life in that way. Right. And um, it, it, this brings me to the idea of a mixed economy. Can you have you know, semi-socialism in a country, uh, you know, Paul Krugman recently put out an article, maybe it was like in late 2018, that you could, ha you could have socialism in certain sectors of the economy. And of course, the big ones that come to mind are healthcare. Right? You in England, you have the, the NHS and here in Canada, we have universal healthcare and they're held up by people espousing socialism to be um, successful examples of a partial uh, social socialist sector within the economy yeah um, several points here first yeah Britain had a mixed economy until the 1980s well I mean it, it still has depends on what you mean uh, by that all economies are mixed to some extent there are no purely capitalist economies but Britain had a model in, in the post-war decades and until the 80s in, in which the state operated a lot of companies that could also easily have been private and that were then to a large extent privatized under uh, the Thatcher government, uh, telecommunications and uh, British Airways and British Telecom and so on all being state owned. That is possible and that is not as bad as full on socialism because those would often be companies that operate in a market. They still have private competitors. They might be propped up by the government. It might it might distort competition, but you still have competition of sorts. And that's the big difference between uh, even places like France, where, where the state still does have some, uh, some state-owned companies, where, where they haven't gone all the way towards uh, privatizing all of that, but where they would still operate in a market environment and are therefore forced to behave to to some extent like private entrepreneurs would also behave. So it's a very different situation whether you have, when you have a company, uh, when you have a market with several players and one or two of them are state owned, well, they still face competition. They are still in a competitive environment where consumers can go elsewhere. So you cannot fully politicize them. If uh, you tried to insulate those companies, if, if you tried to uh, ignore consumer demand and uh, make them follow political priorities, then they would quickly lose customers and they would then be forced to go back to uh, normal management methods and conventional business models. So that is far less bad than an economy uh, like the actual socialist economies, like the Soviet Union, where consumers have nowhere else to go, where you have a state monopolist in every sector, and that's it, largely. Right. Unless, unless you count the back market. Which always comes up around the edges of, a, of, of social, well, socialized sectors or countries. You, the, black, the black market always asserts itself, doesn't it? Yeah, where, where it can. The problem with black markets is that uh, by its very nature, it has to be, it has to keep a low profile. So that means that is uh, something that you can only do in uh, in certain sectors. You could not have 
an airline company on the black market. It can right. really only be street street trading things that are not highly visible. Mm-hmm. But, but going back to your healthcare example, uh, yes, you are right. Healthcare can be publicly provided, but even here. I mean, and, and, and I've written a book about this three years ago, uh, comparing the, the National Health Service to to its counterparts elsewhere. And um, even though in when when you have one socialized sector in a market economy, that is less bad than, than full on socialism, because that uh, that state run health uh, service here can draw on a productive private sector, and that's where it gets its resources from. But even then, you get better healthcare in most of Western Europe, where healthcare is uh, p- at least partly market provided. So the the NHS is not particularly good if you compare it to market oriented systems in in Western Europe to uh, the systems in Switzerland and the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, which have a much greater degree of reliance on market forces, a, la- a large private sector. And uh, and I, I would imagine this applies to Canada as well. In, in Canada. Uh, well, I was about to ask that because am yeah. I am I to understand that um, I think this is the case. So in, in countries like Germany and other Europe, Western European countries, there is, I guess, what we would call two-tier healthcare. So there's the public system and then there is also a private sector available. But they would be integrated. It would be this distinction between public and private is uh, something that plays a role here with with nationalized healthcare. You either use NHS care or you go private. It doesn't exist to that to the same extent in uh, in in competitive social insurance systems like in the Netherlands and Germany. There, you would have an insurance company that covers your healthcare costs, and you can then. Choose to get your healthcare from whoever you like. It can be a, a public, publicly run hospital. Can be a privately uh, run one. On, on can be on a on a non-profit or on a for-profit basis. It's just that if you want something on top of that, something on uh, on, on top of what is covered by a statutory healthcare, then you can choose to to top that up privately. But it's not that you would cease to be, that you would leave one healthcare system and enter a different healthcare system. Mm-hmm. It would be more that you you would go to the same hospital as everyone else. That can be owned privately or publicly; it doesn't matter. And your health insurer would normally cover uh, accommodation in, let's say, a five bedroom. And now, if you want single room accommodation, you can do that, and then you pay the extra cost for that. But it's not that you cease to be a public patient and become a private patient. It's more that you buy one upgrade, mm-hmm. uh, one particular upgrade, and, and pay specifically for that. But you are not a different type of patient, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you for that. Um, looking at a couple of the, you know, the pillars of the objectives of socialism when I was reading through the book and, and elsewhere, of course, is... You know, two of them are democratizing the workplace and decommodifying labor. And I have a hard, well, I hear these phrases a lot, and I have a hard time understanding what they even mean by that. I suppose more so with decommodifying labor. I mean, if you if you need to dig a ditch and you have to get a bunch of people to dig a ditch, they're interchangeable ostensibly. How is how are you going to decommodify that? And the democratizing, I mean, maybe we should take these separately. I don't know. Democratizing the workplace, to me, the easiest way to do that is you just let people start their own businesses competitively. Yeah, of course. You, you, can, you can have uh, democratically run businesses. That already exists. That's the cooperative model. And that is very successful in some sectors. We have a supermarket chain here, the co-op, which seems to do, to be doing rather well, which is, I uh, don't know the exact business model, but yeah, to some extent, uh, de- democratically run. And, and why not? Nothing wrong with that. But it's a, a model that doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody wants to get involved in business decisions in that way. Some people just want to turn up at nine o'clock and go home again at, at five o'clock. And uh, otherwise... 
not bother with business decisions and that that's a perfectly legitimate uh, attitude to take not not everybody has to be an entrepreneur and uh, in a capitalist economy you, you can have very different business models very different models of organizing a, a company internally they can be they can range from very democratic to very hierarchical and many things in between and that's the point of a market economy that, that we can experiment with these different types and different uh, models of running things and then we just see which of them work sometimes one is clearly superior to the other and, and then the inferior one uh, disappears everybody just adopts whatever the market leaders do but sometimes you have you have different models that work for different people and this is why you can have these uh, democratically run co-ops alongside more conventional businesses. I think the key point there is that people are voluntarily entering into these working uh, arrangements and these types of companies. It's not a case of, of someone saying, okay, everyone's now going to have democratized workplaces and we're unionizing everything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They, they are firstly self-selecting. That's why... It works, and uh, it it would no longer work if you try to force everyone into it. And then there is also the aspect that, uh, of of course, uh, that is uh, getting involved in business decisions means this is entrepreneurial activity. You would then no longer just be some somebody who uh, who works in exchange for for a wage and just does. Um, follow some standardized procedure but you would yourself become actively involved in management decisions then that's what democratizing means and that is of course not everyone's cup of tea and if you tried to to increase the share of of people uh, who who are, who are doing that um well you, you would the, the problem would be that that you would try to cajole a lot of people who don't actually want to get involved into those kinds of activity in those activities uh, you, you would have to to push them into it yeah it's it's all well and good to set up a company and run it in that way but uh people who talk about democratizing the workplace what they usually mean is they want a company that is already successful, already successfully run, and uh, hand control over that to people who don't own it. And this is the problem. It's the assumption that successful companies are just somehow there. Well, they're not just somehow there. They are. They have been set up by somebody who had an idea and who took a big risk. And uh, in, and, and, uh, in some cases it worked. And um, that's why it, it would now just, just be wrong to tell them, okay, you've, uh, thanks for your effort, thanks for, for your great ideas, but it is now no longer yours. Y you now have just as much of a say uh, or no more of a say than the people who work for you and who, are, who, who haven't been involved in setting up the company and taking the risk and making all those strategic decisions that you've made. Well, that's, that's what I was about to say there. The defining word out of all of this is risk. And not everybody wants to bear risk, and nor should they if they don't want to. If you just want to do your job and get paid and go home and not have to worry about whether um, you know, the company is how it's gaining or losing against competitors and ch changing environment, and you don't want to put your own capital on the line, then that's fine. You don't have to, but uh, again, you know, it's the people who build the build and fund these companies that take the risk to make them successful or not. And I think that I might get a little off the beaten path here, but um, I, you mentioned uh, pictures of our socialistic future in the in the very intro to your book, and mm -hmm. uh, we just finished the audiobook version of that. It's about to, I'm just waiting for it to to go live on the Audible system. And I wrote a new foreword to that book, and in there I mentioned that I think one of the prime drivers behind this um, infatuation with socialism now is because risk was removed from the equation during the global financial crisis. And a lot of people who got themselves into trouble, namely the financial sector, uh, were absolved of the risk and they were bailed out and then they went on to um, 
and then they went on to give themselves lavish bonuses and then they enjoyed 10 years of Cantillon effect since then and that seemed to turn the entire risk model on its ear and I think that did a lot of damage to the to the to the credibility of people arguing capitalism and free markets even though what happened there was anything but yeah, I remember thinking that at, at the time, uh, thinking if they really go ahead with these bailouts, this will be held against us for the rest of time. That uh, anti-capitalists will then always say, ah, but you had money for the banks. Why not for this? Why not for that? And uh, casting that, presenting that as, as, as somehow hypocritical, even though, of course, supporters of the market economy, the ones that were consistent, did say at the time there should be no bailouts, even though they did know that that would mean the economic crisis would have been more severe. Yes. But what, what happened was actually worse. It was, uh, okay, you, you, you limited the economic damage, but caused much greater political damage in the process. It did give the impression, not just the impression, but uh, of a system that was fundamentally rigged and uh, undermined the already very shaky trust in the market economy. I mean, market economies are never enthusiastically endorsed. They, they are accepted as long as they deliver the goods, but then even then, most grudgingly, capitalism has never been popular anywhere. It's it's just counterintuitive capitalism. But before the crisis, there, there was a, a, a loose acceptance saying, yeah, the market economy, okay, uh, in in theory, I'd prefer something else, but it, it sort of seems to work, so, so why not? And that was uh, swept away with the bailouts. But even then, I'd say it wasn't so much that a powerful clique of bankers forced the government to bail them out. It was more a panic reaction and uh, gaps in the the legal system as well. That uh, th there was this myth that the, the financial sector in the Western world was completely unregulated. It wasn't, of course. It, it was it was very highly regulated. It's one of the most highly regulated sectors in any economy. But what there wasn't was uh, a clear legal framework for for letting a bank fail in in such in an orderly way. That was the key gap. It would be. If an, an, an energy company fails, it's not that its customers would have no electricity the next day, but rather it would be wound up in an orderly way. Other companies would buy the assets, you, you, your contract would be transferred, and uh, you would still get your electricity the next day just from someone else. It, it would all be done in, in an orderly fashion. And uh, that such a mechanism did not exist, I think, in the in the financial sector, that you can take out some players without that causing chaos for the wider system. Right. It does happen elsewhere. In, in, in many other sectors, you have much greater um, turnover rates, very a, a lot of bankruptcies going on all the time, companies going out of business, but it doesn't destabilize the sector as a whole because they just get quickly those those gaps that they leave get get filled again quickly in the banking sector it wasn't like that mostly because most of the time we don't have bank failures it's it's a it's a relatively static market not a lot of new uh, entries and not a lot of exits and yeah the, the regulators were just not prepared for that just mm -hmm. creating a system in which you can have an orderly failure of a bank and then but then also a credible no no bailout clause that would do wonders. Right, right. You mentioned, and you mentioned it in the book, how, how capitalism really is counterintuitive to people. They would prefer something else. Let's, let's go over the stages of socialism, you know, in the, the, the initial love affair to the that wasn't real socialism arc, and maybe within the context of, say, a Venezuela today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've come up with this three-stage pattern with this uh, theory that, that socialist systems, you always go through three stages in terms of their reception by Western intellectuals, which is the honeymoon period, the period during which the system has some initial success and is widely praised. 
and uh, then a period of making excuses and and uh, or trying to deflect attention and then finally the final stage when western socialists uh, claim oh no that example was never socialist the uh, the, the retroactive disowning so what happens is socialist systems often have some initial success it's not clear from the first day on that those will be basket cases the soviet union for example was industrializing rapidly in the 1930s during the time of the first five year plans they had uh, they became a global superpower and that couldn't be denied even by by anti-socialists even people who hated socialism had to to uh, accept that that was happening and um, during a period like that almost nobody says that's not real socialism and that's when western socialists want to take the credit for it and, and want to say yes these are our ideas in action and all the <laughs> wonderful things that happened over there is because of our ideas and that's uh, the exact same thing happened in venezuela um the causes were different in in the case of venezuela it was because of a, of an oil price boom but uh, whatever the causes you always get this initial period normally lasts for a bit more than a decade when uh, socialism seems to work seems to have some initial success and that's when it was it is widely praised by by western socialists and that that's what i uh what i show in in uh, in various chapter chapters of the book about successive examples that you always get this period during during which very high profile mainstream figures praise the system and wax lyrical about it and it really is mainstream well-established uh, uh, prominent intellectuals i'm not i'm deliberately not looking at a few obscure french figures because then my opponents would just say oh you're cherry picking you're just <laughs> picking out a few unrepresentative examples no i i try to look uh, really at well-established uh, uh, very prominent intellectuals people like noam chomsky where you can't say you're picking out a few atypical cases. Noam Chomsky is clearly a rock star intellectual and a best-selling author. He, he is an, an iconic figure for some on the left and quoting people like him, you, you can't dismiss that as cherry-picking atypical figures. And, and since this is since uh, since this is a Canadian company, uh, Naomi Klein, of course, uh, right, yeah. will be Vote for you. Naomi Klein was also added in the, and she's in the Venezuela chapter. Of course, she was one of those people who who, uh, who were praising that model. Right. Just a, just a couple more things before I let you go. Uh, do you think with um, this newfound um, momentum for democratic socialism that there's a real groundswell support for it, or do you think it's a new vogue and a vocal minority, you know, with the wind at their back of a of a you know a left a left leaning biased media that makes it sound like everyone is pining for this? No, I'm afraid it's more than that. I've uh, I've looked at a lot of surveys on would show attitudes to economic policy and uh, it isn't just a few activists there is really widespread mass support for a lot of socialist policies such as nationalizations and price controls and the government uh, dictating how companies should be run telling them how to structure their affairs internally all those things are wildly popular that may not be completely new maybe that was already true 10 15 20 years ago it's just that then those were low salience issues, issues that where people felt that way but didn't care strongly about it would and would not necessarily have voted for a party say, that um, that advocates and, and promises those things. It would be a bit like the EU here in Britain where uh, it, it's not that during the referendum there was suddenly uh, everyone turning against the EU. It's more that the EU was never popular here but nobody really minded it very much. It, it was, uh, if, if you had asked people before the referendum, what are the most important uh, challenges you think that Britain is facing, um, the EU would never have been uh, in, in the top 10. It would always be bread and butter issues. And then as an also ran, somebody might also have mentioned the EU, but it's something that nobody usually cared about. And I guess that is what changed now, that uh, you have this, 
we had this latent anti-capitalism for for quite a while but now it's becoming a lot more high salience you you have very prominent figures in the media and uh, in, in social movements advocating those those policies and it becomes a form of status signal that uh, you show you you show off your socialist credentials on social media and your social status goes up because that's that's uh, just a fashionable thing to do you show that you are invoked that you are part of uh, the self self-perceived uh, vanguard and um, yeah I'm afraid that's that's what's going on the ideas aren't new it's just become fashionable again Right. So do you think that there could be a foray into full-blown socialism in, you know, can it happen here? And by here, I guess, I mean, there where you are, the UK, Europe, they're a little further down the path than we are here. Well, Canada, we're getting there. United States, what do you think? Oh, well, the political dynamics, that's um, something that I don't know a great deal about because that depends also on on party internal factors, something that I can't really comment on. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you always have socialist movements within bigger parties, but they would not be the only ones. That you, you would have forces within that the same party trying to, to moderate them. And... Um, I don't know. Sometimes there is just a lot of you get a lot of talk about uh, socialism, but n- no consequences are are drawn uh, from that. It's. Uh, I mean, we, in the beginning we talked about Scandinavia. Why do some people think, think Scandinavia is, is is socialist? I think part of the reason is that the political discourse, the rhetoric of Scandinavian politicians would sound a lot more socialist than the rhetoric of uh, politicians in the Anglosphere. And, um, but then again, in those places, they manage apparently to talk about socialism a lot without uh, actu- actually doing it, without actually implementing socialist policies. And, and you can have this uh, constructive hypocrisy where you <laughs> tell people what they want to hear, tell them the socialist nonsense they want to hear, but uh, at the same time you're smart enough to not actually do it. Um, so this so- is socialist rhetoric and the uh, almost capitalist economy then. That would be as, as good as it gets right now, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm not sure. Sometimes, uh, I mean, Britain is uh, a case of, unfortunately in Britain, uh, it could well be that Britain has this tendency to also to actually follow through mm-hmm. uh, on, on bad ideas. So clearly in the, in the post-war decades, uh, Britain went half of the way towards socialism, and that was the the period of relative decline when when Britain, which was once the, the most prosperous, most advanced economy, became a laggard in relative terms, was overtaken by most of the rest of Western Europe, was was behind Italy for a while, which uh, nowadays uh, sounds unimaginable. You'd think the, the north of Europe, including Britain, those are the uh, the, the economic powerhouses and. Uh, it's in southern Europe where where you have an ongoing economic malaise and crisis conditions. But um, no, it wasn't always that way. It's uh, in in those years they there were a lot of bad ideas floating around, and Britain was one of the places actually followed up and and uh, walked the talk. I should put those ideas in action. <sighs> well. Let's hope uh, nobody else tries it anytime soon, but I'm not that optimistic about it. But uh, Christian, it's been great talking to you. Uh, I've had Dr. Dr. Christian Neimitz on, the author of Socialism, The Failed Idea That Never Dies. The book is available pretty well everywhere now. I'm seeing a lot of buzz about it in social media. And we're coming out with the audio book, which would, should be on, should be available by the time you hear this podcast. Thanks, Christian. Thank you.